Okay, so have you ever been around a campfire and seen different colors burning? Yeah, I've done that. And have you noticed how the different colors are related to what you're burning? Yeah, I've seen that. Well, it turns out that different elements have different colors because of the energy that they're absorbing and the way that their electrons move uh, on those different elements. Okay, now this um, flame emission is what we call it, information is, is fairly interesting and very informative about the elements themselves. Okay, now it wasn't quite clear exactly why you would get different colors when you burn uh, elements that have the same um, makeup. They're all made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so what these electrons were doing was kind of confusing. Um, but what they realized is that when you are energizing, and you don't have to do this on a flame, you can also do this in a, in a vacuum tube, right? You've heard of neon lights? Yeah, I went to Las Vegas, I saw neon lights. Okay, good. And they're at your, you know, most grocery stores now, they have a little neon light somewhere. Um, but they call them neon lights because there's actually neon on the inside. Um, you can also uh, put sodium on the inside and you get the same color as this uh, sodium emission. Your light bulb will look kind of like this orange color, right? And so um, the different elements give off different colors because what's happening is the nucleus of your atom has a number of electrons around it. And as the electrons around it are excited by the heat of the flame or by electricity passing through a, a vacuum bulb like in a, a neon light, right? Or even most uh, incandescent lights nowadays are the same concept. The electrons are excited and they move up. And then the electron, after it's done being excited, moves down. So the energy from the, the heat or the light, sorry, the, the electricity, moved it up. But when it moves down, there is a wavelength of uh, a photon, a wavelength of light, wavelength of electromagnetic energy released. All right. So the electron is excited by either the energy of the, the burning or the electricity. And then it, it is um, drops back down again relaxes and a photon of electromagnetic energy is released. Now, the problem was, if I think about two different atoms, um, it didn't really make sense why um, they would make different colors. Why would you have an atom of sodium release a color that is, let's say this is a, a yellow wavelength, right? And then have um, an atom of copper different number of electrons, but why would that make it that after that electron was excited and then relaxed back down, why would it release a different color? Why, 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 why does it release the green color? And um, what we're seeing here, what we're learning, is that the amount of distance that the electron falls relates to the color of light that's emitted. Right, Or in other words, the energy of the different wavelengths. Now, colors relate to different energies now. Hopefully you've done those problems and you kind of realize that. That if you see a, in, uh, intra, or sorry, a, a violet light, ultraviolet, so close to that range, then the energy that's being released is, is high compared to the energy that's being released if you see a red light. Right? So... The color of the light relates to the energy that was not just released when it fell down, but also the energy that was absorbed when it uh, was excited. Okay, And so what this was showing was that the wavelengths of light that were released were fixed. You can't burn sodium and get it to release a green light. You can't burn copper. So this is representing our copper here and get it to release um, a yellow light. And that was kind of confusing because we kind of thought about these electrons in their orbitals as being in orbitals, but also kind of thought of them as having the ability to kind of come closer and farther away in those orbitals. 
But the fact that elements only release a very distinct color of light when they're excited, oops, when they're excited, shows that um, the location of the orbital is fixed, that the electron resides in is fixed. And the transition that can occur, the excitation and the relaxation, is also fixed. And it's element specific. So depending on the element, it depends on what your excitation can be and what the relaxation can be. Now this was kind of frustrating because it seemed that you should be able to just excite that electron to any wavelength in between there. And then it would be able to relax to any wavelength. And then you could see basically any color. But that's not what we found, right? And that's basically what the black or the uh, the um, this previous experiments are also showing the photoelectric effect that elements released energy the, the atoms and the elements were specific to how much energy were, was necessary to make those electrons uh, excite or eject off in the case of the photoelectric effect. So. This, you know, atomic emission spectra that you get, or in other words, you put an element into a vacuum tube, energize it with some electricity, and watch the color that comes off. Um, it's very specific to the kind of element that you have here. That's the way we can look up in space and know what elements are out there based on the uh, wavelengths of light that come back uh, from their burning or from their emission. Okay? And so what this told us was that the distance and thus the energy between the, the um, orbitals in an atom were quantized, were quantized or fixed. And this was very bothersome because, again, it, it just seemed like uh, if I were to think about a model of the atom, I would think about a nucleus here and an electron moving around and that electron could get closer or farther away or, or you know, change its location but that's not what we we discovered by kind of studying these different effects what we discovered was that the location of the electron for each element or the different orbitals are fixed in their distance from the nucleus okay they are quantized. Now quantized, the opposite of quantized is continuous. So you see this turtle? Yeah, I have a turtle. You have a turtle? Yeah, I have one at home. That's nice. What's its name? Uh, Rocky. Oh, really? That's great. How long have you had it? Uh, we, we adopted it. It's like hundreds of years old or something. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, anyway, a turtle can travel down a ramp like this and you can make it be at any position along this ramp and its position could kind of represent its energy level. However, if a turtle is traveling along a staircase, then it could only be at very fixed locations. So you would say this is a continuous model for the energy of the turtle and this is a quantized model for the energy of the turtle. And we found from our, again, study of matter that the location, the energy levels of electrons are quantized in their uh, location and energy. So what do you think? Which one of these musical instruments provides a quantized tone? Uh, the violin. Violin. Have you ever heard a violin? Have you ever heard it go... Right? You can slide your finger along that core or that uh, string and make different noises. Yeah, you can do that with the guitar too, so that's not it. The flute? Well, have you ever blown a flute? Have you ever heard of a slide whistle? Slide whistle? No. Well, a slide whistle, you can change the length of your uh, tube and it'll go. And you can do that same thing with a flute. You tune it by changing its length. Oh, then it must be a piano? That's right, a piano. Because a piano has like a harp, just has, or not like a harp, but just it's like a harp inside, but it doesn't give you the opportunity to play between given notes. You have an A or a C, dun, and then a D, dun, but you don't have anything in between. Dun, 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 dun. Are there any sounds in between? 
Uh, I don't know. Yeah, of course there are. Dun, right? All those sounds that my voice made in between exist, but a piano can only play very quantized notes. Okay? So this idea of quantized electrons began to open lots of different ideas. Um, it kind of got rid of our, our model, right? Our model for the atom, uh, which we liked so much, um, doesn't really work very well. Um, Bohr tried to solve equations that would express the energy of the electrons. And he found a set of equations that would work, but just for um, n equals 1, which means one energy level, one electron. So if I had a hydrogen atom, one proton, one electron, then as this electron was excited, and you can excite a single electron farther away from the nucleus, and as it would relax down, you could identify equations that would relate this energy to its location, but the, the model would fail as you got more electrons in it. Um, so our, our words for when an atom absorbs energy, we say it absorbs, or when an atom emits energy, emits, and absorption occurs when electromagnetic energy hits an atom, and the electrons jump up in terms of their orbital, and we call these orbitals n values, n values equal 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth, and n uh, never will be 0, uh, n is also related to the energy level, the energy level, because um, as the electron gets farther away, it has more energy, all right, um, and when it relaxes down, what did we say happens when it relaxes down? Oh, uh, it, it emits a, um, a photon of energy. That's right, a wavelength of light, right? Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily need to be visible light. It might be ultraviolet or uh, um, infrared, right? Or even an X-ray, right? But when electrons drop down, that energy is released in the form of light or electromagnetic energy. All right, so the Bohr's model doesn't work for a couple of reasons. And the Bohr's model meaning basically our, our orbital model of an atom. One is because um, the electron, uh, if it were to travel around in circles like that, it should be losing angular momentum. It should be losing energy as it, as it makes those turns. And that would cause it to kind of gradually fall down into the nucleus. But we don't see this happening. The other thing that uh, Bohr's model couldn't explain is it couldn't explain um, more than one electron in, in, in terms of energy levels. Okay, you couldn't calculate the colors that you would expect for um, electrons transferring from orbital to orbital in systems that had more than one electron. Okay, so to explain why Bohr's model didn't work, we have to understand more about, see so, you now Bohr's model being our orbital model here where electrons are traveling around in little orbitals around a nucleus. And to explain why this doesn't work, we have to discover more properties of light. And we'll do that next time.